Um, so welcome to our final concurrent session of the CQU Virtual Scholarship of Teaching Conference for 2019. So this afternoon we have four presenters and they've all got really interesting topics to share about the use of educational technologies in tertiary teaching. Now first up I'd like to ask you all to check that your microphones are on mute so that we can avoid feedback and interference. Um, and also let you know that look you're free to switch off your cameras if you want to, particularly if Zoom shows that your internet connection is unstable. But Likewise, you're quite able to leave them on so we can see all of your smiling and happy faces. So our session theme this afternoon is educational technologies. Uh, this theme includes approaches to, that use technology to inform your work as an academic, like communication techniques, uh, innovative student contact or monitoring student online engagement. And it also includes theory-based practice, the nexus between pedagogy and technology and or simulated learning. So first up we have Mina Jar, and I can see her, she's there in my window on the top left hand screen. Uh, she's a lecturer in Information and Communications Technology at CQU's Sydney campus with an interest in learning analytics to improve learning and teaching, among other things. Uh, today she's going to be talking about how to develop a virtual agent or a Verta model for adapting higher education system. Uh, can I please ask you to share your screen, Mina, and go for it. Alright guys, today I'm going to talk about to develop a virtual agent, VERTA, the name I have given it, model for an adapting higher education system. This is a project we did with uh, Macquarie University and it is in collaboration with Macquarie and Central Queensland University. Now the whole idea is that uh, we have been looking at the students learning behavior and you know, learning and our characteristics as informed by research vary for each individual learner. Many students require help while doing their assignments or understanding weekly teaching resources or finding out the impact of not referencing others' work correctly. Educators and other stakeholders are spending a lot of time in explaining and documenting assessments, teaching resources, responding onto their emails, responding onto the forums, unit profiles and how to correctly reference the resources. However, students are st still struggling to understand these documents. The consequences of a student failing to understand an assessment item, weekly teaching resources, information in unit profile, or how to correctly reference can impact the student's success in the unit and actually can lead to low retention rate. So what we thought yeah. of Okay, artificial, so what we did was the making use of artificial intelligence to see that, you know, or to help our students learning in the, for the unit profile, helping them out during the assessments when they need the help. So we made, actually, we found that using artificial intelligence can make the educational experience more engaging to students and teachers. AI can assist and provide alternatives to teachers needing to repeat the same answers and concepts multiple times and thereby reducing actually te teachers burnout. The students, they send, they post, uh, you know, questions on forums at 12 o'clock, midnight, and they are really panicky when they need to do their assessments. And that is what we tried, you know, uh, handling that, that main problem. Research has found that learner relationships, teacher and peer involving computer-based learning are similar to equivalent human-human learning relationships in the classroom. So we have developed, hosted and tried virtual agent and we call it VERTA for computer science and information technology science units at two different universities. It was being hosted at Macquarie and at Central Queensland University. That simulates a teacher in providing help towards understanding a unit and its requirements. What is the problem and why VERTA? Currently, students looking for information either send an email to the teaching staff or post a message on the Moodle learning management system, discussion forums, and wait for responses from the teaching staff. The responses from the teaching staff may get delayed because of several reasons and students, if time constrained, they get further panicked and stressed in contrast what VERTA does. So in contrast, VERTA, the unit helper is available 24-7, resolves the issue of late responses received from teaching staff, 
And there has been actually evidences which shows VAs in the context of MOOC. However, we could not find any literature in Austro-Asian context where VAs are used in education. There are several, you know, virtual agents being used elsewhere. Chatbots are being used, but not the virtual agents the way we have done. So our research focuses on the use of VAs in the university system. This is our character. We developed using uh, Unity 3D. Designing and building a character from scratch is both time and labor intensive. So what we did, we used Adobe Character Creation Software Fuse, and we, you know, it's Character Animation Repository website, mixamo.com to design and animate our character. So actually, when you know, students click onto this character, you can see some emotions also coming up. You know, she blinks the eyes and she you know, talks and speaks. And it was being deployed on lamps. So Verta was deployed on uh, online in a web browser using WebGL and made accessible on the respective unit pages. Uh, students are going to click onto the link provided to them. Uh, and this was used actually lab, Linux, uh, Apache, My, SQL, PHP environment using national e-research collaboration tools and resources. When we use this Veta, we had, we created a dialogue as students would ask the teacher that what kind of you know assessment is this what i need to do this in this assessment or any specific questions so we developed a dialogue how students are going to ask the teacher so these are there are some sample dialogues i have provided over here but the repository is huge so if a student, you know, sample student dialogue options, if a student presses start, the VETA is going to talk and because it is speech enabled, going to say that this is a virtual character in deployment, you know, and we are conducting research to test, test its utility just to cover all the ethical things, aspect of it, because it is still research in progress kind of project. So unit overview or what I'm going to learn in this unit or assessment task, whatever, you know, related to the, the dialogue creation was being done with help of the unit coordinators of different units. Interesting results. How students interact with this virtual character is we generated some dialogues and we found that the students are actually looking at responses of dialogue two, which is more is which is actually focusing on assessments. So students are looking at we, in the first half of this you know session, previous session, we Haley Hale, Hale was talking about how students are only looking at assessments. Our research actually conforms to that, that it is actually students are looking at all the informations related to assessment task. Now the other thing is, what is very important to see the outcome of this, you know, hosting this virt as a trial version, the students are accessing this at very odd hours when they require help. So it is either 12 a.m. from, you know, morning, evening, you know, they are, look, they are accessing VATA at in the night, midnight, they are accessing that. The result in the beginning, they are not how much they are engaged with this in the beginning. Not many students were engaged, but as the assessments started approaching, they were more engaged with VATA looking at how to reference how many scholar, scholarly you know citations they need to use how to write the assessment is there any template provided um, 
uh, the, actually many of, you know, some of them, not many, some of them have also asked that how to take an extension on the assignment. We used, we collected the data, it was being hosted on, uh, on uh, actually the link was being provided onto Moodle and the data was being saved onto the server. We extracted the data into an Excel CSV file. We put that data onto RapidMiner to see, to predict that based on students' behavior that how they are engaged with Verta, what information they would like to get from Verta in future. And most of them, can you see that it is most likely assessment task. They are not looking at unit overview or my attendance requirements or lectures or tutorials. It is all associated, related with assessment tasks. For university, as I said, that it has been, you know, this research has been done on two universities, Macquarie and uh, uh, CQU and Macquarie. So we have just named it A and B. And for University A, 289 log files responses from students using VETA were recorded from June 2019 to September 2019. Now, assessment three was due in October and there wasn't a single click onto assessment three. They were only looking for assessment one and assessment two. That actually shows that the students do not want to get overloaded with the information which they don't require or they don't find it for of immediate use. No matter how many times you tell them in the class or what you say then, they will not pay, you know, as we would like them to pay that much of attention. So. Responses, dialog option chosen by dialogues are they are labeled redialog XXX. Most of the recorded responses are dialog redialog two. Seeking help in assessment tasks, followed by redialog hundred saying that they want to move on to another query, which is another assessment task. So this provides an empirical evidence that the students are willing to use Verta to gain support to understand the assessment task. The least recorded is redialog 483. And redialog 10C is about help in assessment three. And this is what I said, then, which was due in week 12 and the data was collected in week 10. So they haven't checked that. And student did not look at assessment three when data was collected. This supports that students do not want to receive information if it is not of immediate use to them. Uh, the results of our study show the benefits of using a VA in computer science units. We have seen that the students are coming back. It is not that one user has used Verta only one time. They are coming back to use Verta several times. The biggest advantage of using VA is students can take help from virtual assistant. Requiring help from VA is time independent and location independent. VA is hosted on web browser, link is provided on to Moodle site. Results have revealed that students do require help at odd hours and are constrained if teachers are not available to give them timely advice. The majority of, and also the, our result an analysis, we have analyzed that students are using this Verta towards when the assessments are due suddenly the frequency of the use of Verta has increased over that, you know, period. So the majority of the students were using VA for assessment, tasks, and unit overview. The students' interaction and engagement with VA has increased during the course of the study. So these are all my references. Thank you for listening to my presentation. Questions? Happy to answer. Thanks, Mina. Um, you're right on time. Well done. You've still, you finished with two and three quarter minutes to go. <clears throat> That's brilliant. Um, so if you can stop sharing your screen, I'll ask everyone to hold on to their questions until the end uh, so that we can manage time more um, effectively. But if you'd like to write them down or stick them in the chat ahead of time uh, so you don't forget, that would be great. And uh, we'll have a question session at the end. So um, our next presenter 
uh, is Sharon Stanton, who's a lecturer in the School of Nursing, Midwifery and Social Sciences at CQU. And uh, she's presenting about something that sounds really interesting, um, Q&A with Sarah Jane, an innovative method for information dissemination in online learning units. So over to you, Sharon. Thank you very much. Can I please check that you can only see the presentation and not the, the feed screen? No, I can just see the presentation. Um, I assume that you're, you've got the notes on another screen. Yes, I do, yes. And I unfortunately, yes, I do use my notes. So buckle up. Here we go. <laughs> okay, so yes, my uh, um, presentation today is about an innovative method for in information dissemination in an online learning unit. So for those of us teaching into online units or subjects, it's easily argued that one of the most difficult components is student engagement, particularly in very large cohorts. In the Bachelor of Nursing, we have upwards of um, 450 students in most, I would argue, many of our units, if not most. With online learning, it's easy to fall into the habit of consistently presenting information to students in the written word. Add into the mix the very nature of our student cohorts and modern higher education. Gone are the days when university study is primary and everything else had to fit around it, your work, your family or your life. Um, now with online access, we are seeing a trend of student, students making university fit around them and their other life commitments. In order to make this journey more accessible, bite-sized learning must be considered, but reading reams of words whether study guides or written resources can be mundane and many students find the task arduous and difficult to maintain. Many students report being time poor and to block out chunks of time for reading around life and work commitments can mean late nights, early starts or times when they're rushing through content. It is reasonable to assume then that poor retention, poor information retention is sure to follow. Hence we must consider edutainment. Um, I'm using this term very flippantly um, because the primary goal is information dissemination and hopefully some retention. For this outcome, I have created Sarah Jane and her chat show. So the details around the activity for Sarah Jane include um, students in a third year undergraduate nursing unit were given a block of information to introduce the concept of guardianship. Um, Rather than presenting them with a block of writing or just giving them links to the public trustee and other parties, it was offered as a visual presentation. So the goal was to engage, entertain and to educate. Using just PowerPoint um, and its standard features, in my imagination, a presentation was created. Sarah Jane is the host of a chat show and she has interviewed three guests in relation to the concepts of guardianship a nurse, a solicitor and a social worker. The entire presentation is self-playing and runs for around five minutes and is strictly for the dissemination of one concept in one module in one unit, so a very small amount of information. The students were then given reflective questions in the study guide after viewing the presentation in order to solidify the new information. The artwork was purpose-drawn for this presentation by Patrick Shannon. Now the fun part. We all get to watch the actual presentation. There's no questions at the end. Sorry.
was bopping along can I also say there were actually some complaints from some students about the music <laughs> they either loved it or hated it I've got to tell you okay so preliminary results from um, from this after securing ethics approval students were offered the opportunity to respond to a survey in relation to Q&A with Sarah Jane students were selected as those that had passed the unit and those that had accessed the activity the questions were centered around their experience of the activity and 12 students completed the interview process. So it was a small study, but nonetheless important to gain that feedback. In the interest of transparency, I have chosen negative and positive comments from the participants. Some of the students were frustrated with the self playing nature as they're faster readers. The time allowed for reading was chosen to allow slow readers to keep up as well. This could be corrected by asking students to click when they have read the slides. However, one of these same students that said it was too slow also stated it was better than clicking through it themselves. So I'm not sure that there's an answer to that one. 
Um, one student stated that she was uh, that they were unable to connect with the characters due to the artist's style, which is somewhat asexual slash transgender, and they are the students' words. Um, another student stated that um, they would have preferred real characters being interviewed. However, all students stated that they were able to engage with the information better than reading a block of information and did find the novel presentation of the information interesting and different. One student stated, I found the way it was presented to consolidate the information that I was given. I was able to put it all together because of the way you had different people being interviewed. Another statement, I think the delivery method engagement was more. It was kind of interactive and was more visual. It was really great. It, um, I think it's good to mix it all up. When asked if the delivery of the information in the activity increased or decreased their engagement, the following student was quite open in, her, in their response. I actually usually wouldn't probably have bothered reading that sort of information, to be honest. From this one comment um, from just one student, I have increased engagement and learning. Yes, just one concept in one module in one unit, but it's still an increase in that student's engagement and information retention and it makes the students more likely to access other activities within the unit for that engagement. Finally, the creation of an innovative information presentation, it does take some time and it takes some imagination. However, the preliminary feedback from research is showing that it's worth the effort with that increased engagement and information retention. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon, again, Great, well within time. Um, so we are ahead of time at the moment, which is lovely. Um, and I have um, a couple of questions that I'll have for you later on, Sharon. Uh, that was great. It's surprising <laughs> how simple, some, you know, it's quite a simple way of presenting a simple um, use of technology, but quite really surprisingly engaging, really great. And I love the artwork. So. <laughs> Oh, I just you to <laughs> the, the artist is very talented. I love that music and it's actually a free online um, app that I found it in and it comes in all different kinds of instruments. But it just, um, sorry, I know that we shouldn't be answering questions now. But I liked it because it gave that real feel because I'm a, a 71 model. So in my day, we had the, today, the midday show with Ray Martin and <laughs> Yeah, so, so it just it was reminiscent of that old TV style was why I did it that way. So. Yeah, no, that was great. Um, okay, um, so our next presenter, so I'm just juggling apps here. Um, our next presenter, now, do we have Tao Tan Bui with us from Vietnam? Has he been able to, oh, we've got, yes, hello, oh, Rihanna, lovely, that's great. <laughs> Um, I'm not sure whether I pronounced your name correctly, but um, <laughs> Rihanna is easier for me. Yeah, yeah, Rihanna, please. So um, Rihanna is from um, Hua Sen University, is that right? Yes. In Vietnam, and she's presenting to us um, on powerful tools to spice up the teaching and learning of academic writing, something which I think has an interest for all of us. So now, Rihanna, I'll hand over to you if you wouldn't mind sharing your screen. Uh, hello, everyone. It's still now morning in Vietnam, so good morning. <laughs> uh, my name is Rihanna from Hua Xin University. It's been really interesting to hear some of the research from CQU. That was where I used to work when I was in Melbourne. But now I'm going to give a little bit of practical perspective on my experience as a lecturer in EAP, English for Academic Purposes. Uh, so let me give you a bit of a uh, background of uh, my teaching and learner profile. So English uh, for academic purposes, I teach mainly academic writing and uh, my learners are mainly young adults learners who are speakers of other languages. So they are from variety of countries and nationalities and uh, cultural backgrounds as well. Um, so they might have to, uh, to have a bit of intermediate digital skills required because they will need to use technology in my classroom. The two tools that I'd like to introduce now are Padlet, 
which is an online interactive whiteboard, which allows you, you know, if you use post-it notes, have you ever used that in your classroom? So actually with Padlet, you can uh, post the post-it note anywhere on the screen and then you can project it to show to the class and also the students can also incorporate it in their uh, classwork. Another tool that I'd like to introduce is Google Docs, which is an online collaborative writing tool and which can work in real time so the students can see and comment and review what they have written. Let me show you. So in this session, I'll show you two examples how I use these tools and how my students respond to the use of these tools. So let, let's have a look at Google Docs first. So for this task, I've asked them to write a 200 word paragraph about their favorite band or musician. This is within the module of music. They have to include at least two relative clauses because these are target language points and one a positive. Uh, and then they also need to employ four music related vocabulary items from a list that I provided. So what I've got is here, you can see on the screen, uh, this is my student. She's not quite excellent, but I'd like to take it an example because she tried to demonstrate what she have used in her writing. For example, I asked one of the students to highlight the relative clauses that I have included. So you can see here, uh, G Dragon is my favorite singer. Who comes from Korea? <laughs> also, who has the concerts around the world? And who invited Chanel to watch that show? Another instance, after Emily wrote her paragraph, I've asked another student to peer review her writing. So you can see here Fiona, we use the comment section in Google Doc to comment regarding the target language and also some academic uh, terms, for example, hedging language. So you can see Fiona comment here, too certain, maybe you can change it to one of the most. So hedging language. Uh, and me as a teacher, I will go over the comments and if I see any good spot or I can see that all oh, the students are doing a great job, then I'll, I'll praise them. Or I would also, you know, like fix some of the errors and see if they are doing correctly. And this will happen uh, simultaneously, you know, in class, because only the students will have access to an iPad in class. Uh, so I can see that lots of learning is happening not, on, not only learning in terms of the students themselves, but also peer teaching and peer learning. And they need to identify, you know, the target language and, and assess their own learning. Now, let, so this is more about accuracy, you know, error correction. But for the, another, another tool that I'm going to introduce is Padlet. So like I said earlier, Padlet is a whiteboard tool. So you can design it whatever way that you want. So for this task, I have asked them to interpret, analyze, and also design a Padlet. You can imagine it is like a poster, you know, and they need to demonstrate their understanding and their using of vocabulary relative clauses and hedging language. And there are a number of ways that they can use, they can, can show me how they do that. And these are the prompts, like what do you think about the song and uh, how does the song comparing and uh, how they interpret the songs. And then I'll have a class showcase where all of the students will show their work, show their poster. Okay. So now uh, they will also need to demonstrate uh, their use of target language by bolding or italicizing uh, the language. And here is the result. Yeah. 
So you can see this is the whole poster. My students chose the song Seven Years. So it is really creative how she organized her post, you know, posted uh, notes in the shape of number seven. You know, not until she told me then I realized that. And in each post, she will respond to one question that I ask her. So I ask her what you, the meaning of the song, uh, what does she think about the song, and how does it compare to other songs that she listened to, some of the new vocabulary that she have uh, learned from this song, you know. And also, after she have submitted her padlet, her poster in the share page, I have asked all the students to review her poster and write a comment, you know. They need to include both positive comments and also some points that they could try to, to improve on. So you can read from here. Gem, uh, example, Regina said, such a wonderful palette you have done. I appreciate your creativity and imaginative abilities that it distinctly show within your job. One thing you might want to improve is use more visual or some pictures and also represent relationships between you and your dearest people. But I still think, oh, you have done an awesome job. So, you know, from this work and also here, assessment, I can see that students are building report and, and relationship amongst each other. And you know, I assign them to, to peer review randomly. So they can read others' work, but they can also compare their own interpretations in terms of this song with another student's, you know? So they might choose the same songs, but you can see different posters, different representations of understanding. So this will demonstrate, you know, collaboration. And finally, evidence of learning. So how do we know that they have learned new vocab? We can see from here. So like I said, hatching language, it would seem that. So my students, they need to demonstrate that themselves, you know, so they actually learn. Another instance is like, uh, they have to use relative clauses, which is my favorite type of music. And another instant, rhythmic. This is a new vocab and relative clause, you know. So from this ex learning experience, I can be sh not like 100%, but like 80% sure that my students have brought some new concepts, understanding, and also they uh, facilitate learning of their own and their peers. Thank you, everyone. That was terrific. Thank you so much, Rihanna. Um, I love the creativity of it, the fact that you're really encouraging students to um, be creative while they're learning something that could be actually quite boring. You know, yeah. grammar is, is not the most engaging of subjects, so I think that's terrific. Uh, do you find that the students enjoy the tool? Absolutely. You know, I would love to share more, but I'm aware of time. Mm. I can do the class showcase. You know, I have like 18 uh, posters that students have done. And I can see that different students will have different interpretations, different analysis. You can see here all of my students' it. posters. That is only one, so I only show one in my PowerPoint, but there are a lot. So my students can, you know, if they have time at home, they go to each posters and they can also learn from their friends. Some of them are really great. Yeah. I think it's really great. Okay, um, so I'll have to think of a question for you afterwards. I really, really enjoyed your presentation. Thank you, thank you. So now our next presenter, and this is our final presenter for this afternoon. Whoops, sorry. I'm... So uh, this is Miriam Ham, who's a lecturer in education at CQU, who's going to be presenting a project that was conducted with her colleagues in the School of Education, Susan Richardson and Craig Richardson. I think we have all of them here today. Um, 
And the topic is finding the sweet spot, enhancing student learning experiences in collaborative synchronous learning spaces. So can I ask you to share your screen, please, Miriam or Susan or whoever's yeah. presenting. I think Susan might be presenting or Miriam. Yeah. No, Miriam. We're, we're all presenting. We're all yeah. talking. Oh, lovely. Oh, yes. yep. Yep. <laughs> so we're all part of this. I'll share my screen. Um, but I did just want to, before we start, say that, um, Rihanna, that's beautiful that you've done Google Docs because we it was the foundation of our collaborative space. So you've just got to see examples of it. That's brilliant. Thank you. Welcome everyone to our presentation. Those first three presentations, they're a hard act to follow, let me say. They've been creative and very interesting. Uh, welcome to our presentation today. It's called Finding the Sweet Spot. And today's presentation describes our journey. I don't know, Mim, if you, we only need to see one slide there, Mim. Oh, so I did swap it back over. I wasn't sure whether I was looking at the right thing. Here we go. So we just need the very first screen. Yeah, beautiful. Thank you. So um, our presentation describes our journey to discovery of a learning and teaching sweet spot. And this was done through a project that explored the ways in which School of Education lecturers have repurposed traditional ISL learning and teaching approaches and, and methods. So I'll provide a little bit of background to the project before Mim and Craig actually describe their first-hand experiences in navigating their way through to our sweet spot. They will highlight the specific pedagogical strategies and activities that support and nurture interactive and collaborative synchronous learning, offering practical suggestions for the ways in which staff in other schools across the university might engage in new ways with the ISL learning and teaching platform. Thanks, Mim. Next slide. Beautiful. At, um, so at CQ University, we use ISL, which is the interactive system-wide learning platform, to teach classes across multiple campuses. And traditionally, when lecturers are using ISL, from what we've seen, they use a stand and deliver approach. So a didactic approach, which is very efficient in delivering content, but less efficient in engaging students <coughs> in rigorous, interactive, collaborative learning experiences. So through 2018 and 2019, and working with uh, first and second year Bachelor of Education students on both the Cairns and Noosa campuses, we trialled a repurposed ISL teaching delivery style that aimed to emulate the benefits of the face-to-face -face learning and teaching experience. So we tried to use ISL in different ways and we were trying to create a one class, one space feel across the campuses as opposed to a separate campus feel. And if you have a look at the um, image on the left hand side of the screen down the bottom there, you can see that there's a screen at one end which is projecting through into the other campus at um, Cairns. And so we're using face to face synchronously with a streamed video conference ISL platform, but we're trying to set the physical space up so it looks like one large room rather than spaces individually pocketed on campuses. So the focus was on enhancing student and lecturer engagement through collaborative, interactive, whole class learning and teaching experiences. We wanted it to feel like the lecturer, lecturer was right there in the lecture room with all of the students, even for those who were at the end of the ISL screen. So we wrapped some research around our project and we gathered data through the use of surveys and through the use of staff focus groups. And the findings from our project concluded that when working in combination, materials and activities, relationships between lecturers, students and student students, as well as the respective identities of lecturers and students, optimise engaged teaching and learning. And this is what we've come to call our sweet spot. And you can see that in the um, visual image that we've presented there. So now I'll hand over to Mim and Craig. Thank you, Susan. So as a lecturer, I was happy to have a crack at this stuff because it was a really logical response to our existing staffing and student conditions. 
in the initial phases, the fact that it was shiny and new was actually a motivating factor for me. I did want this to work. I did want quality student outcomes and I really did want our repurposed ISL to be successful. But there were challenges. And that first of those challenges was the technology itself. So using our reflective practices framework, what was it that I saw and what did I hear? Initially, I saw many different seating configurations and then finally one day we cracked it. It was sort of trial and error, but we knew immediately when we got it right. So as illustrated in the slide, the lecturer seated and the student sitting just so. And voila, we have a group roundtable setting that was in fact inclusive, intimate and almost perfect. Initially, I heard, and I heard this a lot, Craig, you've disappeared again. Craig, I don't think we can see what you're talking about. Craig, should we be looking at a blank screen? Now these were really minor issues, but in the scheme of things they mattered and they were frustrating and not in any way conducive to the environment we desired. The simple issue of body position, changing the focal point from me to a student, to manipulative materials, to a PowerPoint, to the whiteboard, and if that clicker wasn't responding, oh my goodness. The technology changed many things. One of those things was that off the cuff moments in my teaching had to be carefully planned in advance. Otherwise, the students didn't have the materials to complete the activities. We found by trial and error that a jumbo marker and four inch font is in fact visible when you use a whiteboard. And so it came down to planning and this planning was critical. Students have, must, must have readily available in advance all materials and you yourself must have completed all activities to know the probable outcomes and issues before they occurred. So technical issues aside and including the annoying habit of the ISL line being cut 10 minutes early at the end of every session, we were powering along. And yet, what did I think and what did I actually feel? So challenge two arose and this challenge was about people, relationships and the actual learning environment. What was starting to nag at me was a sense that my CANS group was somehow two dimensional. Interactions with and between this student group were open, polite, students were responsive and yet there was something missing. After much thought, I sort of labelled this the warmth of personal touch. I really missed the ability to check for understanding by looking over a shoulder, to have those one-on-one -on -one chats, to provide feedback, encouragement and assistance pretty much on the spot. I felt this a little bit like a loss. So, reaching out of my pedagogical solitude, I went to the data and I sought input from my peers. What really had our students told us? Student feedback clearly indicated that face-to-face -face by them was seen as intimate, warm and interactive, and for them, desirable. Distance was seen as cold, isolated and impersonal, and a really, do I have to? And our ISL sat somewhere in between. So we set our own performance standard. Our repurposed ISL would be built around the premise that student engagement comes from, from reflective, responsive, pedagogical approach that are totally underpinned by relationships. Our focus became those relationships. How would we build group interaction and trust across the cohort and with the lecturer? Exist existing relationships were a great basis. Becoming increasingly explicit in all feedback helped. Taking time to discuss how everyone was feeling was critical. Simple things like knowing what was topical in cans, even knowing the weather so that we could start to compare our dress sets. These became sort of icebreakers and mixes that helped this group create unity. We also set out and created a set of protocols and these were really helpful. We defined with, it, with clarity what our expectations around engagement were. We talked about the teachable moment and how important it was that we didn't let this slide. We said that interruptions were expected and this notion was reinforced across the term. Students were required to give each other feedback and question each other for understanding. We expected that the students would form relationships. Activities were designed that mandated this interaction that we were seeking, and these became non-negotiable. Data indicated that this was working. 
staff and students indicated the project was successful in terms of student achievement and student engagement. There was a collegial sharing of tips, ideas and interactive practices. We actually began to mentor each other around, about, around that effective pedagogy that was best meeting the needs of this repurposed ISL space. And finally, we ourselves remain positive and upbeat. Students, believe it or not, now request ISL. We know our repurposed ISL meets the needs of our students. So in the last part of our um, sweet spot is identities. We've already visited materials and relationships um, in the last two speakers. So what we found super interesting by the end of the process was that um, two out of five lecturers didn't ever adjust to the disruption that was caused in their teaching. So we realised that it was deeply connected to identity. Um, we, they commented, I feel really discomforted by this ISL teaching. I'm discomforted by a disconnect with my usual teaching methods and the needs of the ISL space. Other colleagues have helped me. Um, when I couldn't change PowerPoints, the clicker doesn't work from that position. I really did try to get the groups talking, but I just didn't manage to create that. My teaching style relies heavily on developing close relationships with students. Their um, comments indicated that um, she was never, that teaching staff member was never able to get that back. So what we found was that um, there was a really distinct difference between three of the teachers and the other two lecturers who could never manage to get um, their identity reinforced. And what was interesting uh, was the way that they responded to the challenges. So for the two lecturers that were discomforted, um, they felt and said things like, I let my students down. I could have done more. I usually teach much better than this. I usually have strong connections with my students. And it appeared that their shift in their professional identity compromised the way that they viewed their um, relationship with their students. Interestingly, this perceived non-relationship was not identified in the data gathered from the students. The students didn't describe the learning and teaching experiences in the, the same way at all. And what was really interesting is when they were presented, the, the teachers that was, the lecturers, when they were presented with evidence of that, that the students actually liked the ISL space, they still could not shift past their own perception of their professional identity being um, shifted. It was as if a barrier had been created through their negative perceptions and they just couldn't get past it. Um, by contrast, the three lecturers who could put aside that discomfort actually engaged really well with the, um, the space and were very active in problem solving. And when we went hunting um, for why this was so, we found that in a very recent work um, of Flavelle's in um, from this year, 19, uh, 2019, um, they talked about this very issue of... Um, people's or lecturers' responses to change in their um, teaching environment is really connected with resilience, their level of resilience. So they found that there was research where uh, lecturers had to be assisted to find solutions to their emotional discomfort in the teaching space. And they advised that um, there be regular discussions with the teachers and that that mentoring should be a little bit more purposeful and that um, in hindsight, that is what we will be implementing a lot more so that people are, our lecturers are guided through that process on how to be resilient and how to respond in a resilient way. So we've, we've been running this uh, for the last two years and we think that the findings from our study are particularly timely because the university is investing a large amount of time and money into the, the CQU Renew and particularly the huddle space trial that's coming. And we really think that um, the, just the repurposing of the technologies uh, will not create the space that people are looking for. You have to include relationships and professional identity uh, as part of that engaging space. So, um, yeah, it's food for thought for the future and we really enjoyed the opportunity to do the research and we'll be continuing it in next year as well. Thanks, Mim. That's our presentation. Thank you. Well done. You came in with 10 seconds to spare. Perfect timing.
<laughs> I'd say we practised, but we hadn't. <laughs> No, oh, look, it was all this practice in doing your um, your online teaching to within that, you know, with that 10-minute thing at the end of the ISL session that always catches everybody. <laughs> no, look, I found that last one absolutely fascinating. Um, as an academic, I have taught online since I started here at CQU. Um, I rarely do face-to-face -face work these days, and with Zoom... <coughs> Zoom coming online, I'm now doing a lot more video sort of stuff um, and I find it quite comfortable but I, I love your description of the, the professional identity thing, particularly I think in an education discipline where so much of your professional identity is tied up in that face-to-face -face relationship building with your students. Yeah. Um, I think that possibly the way in which we... Uh, judge ourselves or assess out our own work you know how we do that maybe what we need to learn about us some new um, new metrics to do that by um, because when you are used to sort of working you know you can look over someone's shoulder you can look at body language you can look at the the, the sort of light bulb moment in the face when you're used to relying on those as an indication of your success you can sometimes miss those online. So absolutely fantastic. So we've now got heaps of time left for questions, which is great because they're just coming thick and fast. Um, so look, while we're talking to Susan and Craig and Miriam, we might stay on that topic. Um, we've got here, um, Samir, you've got a question that you'd like to ask that you've put up on chat. Yes, thank you indeed. Um, I'm very fascinated with this presentation. It, it could be the best that I have seen so far in the last two days. Well done, Susan, Miriam, and Craig. Uh, the question is, uh, have you examined the difference in experiences of teachers as well as students for those who are sitting with a teacher face-to-face -face and those who are remotely connected? Have, have you seen differences in their perceptions about the experience? Miriam, I'll let you answer. Yeah, so no, um, so, uh, Samar, uh, yes, we did. We surveyed both groups and we did, um, didn't actually see a, com a difference between the two responses. They were actually quite similar. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in there. Yep. It, was, it was interesting that in the, our first surveys, a group of students said they thought there was an advantage to having the lecturer live, but the same question asked in our second trial didn't bring that up at all so that that actually had dissipated completely and there was more a, a unified sense of cohort or group and and on the back of that craig the the as we progressed and as we refined the isl space and we refined the protocols the expectations and the pedagogies that the staff members were using we were getting better at it so the students were actually establishing a sense of comfort with it and so they the staff worked really hard for that one space one feel and i think that's what craig was hinting at that then the students the students shifted in their own perceptions about it and, and have come to the point now where they are asking us for our repurposed ISL instead of having to go to distance classes. We also should say that in the first year, 2018, we actually had Townsville in there as well. So we actually had three campuses we were coordinating and it worked it differently, very much differently, but um, yeah, it was still great. Actually, I was going to ask a question about that. Like, I loved the way that you had the monitor at the end of the table set up so that it just looked like you were at this at the one table. I think that's absolutely fantastic. But I was wondering how you would um, manage that sort of same feel if you had multiple locations. Yeah, it was definitely more difficult. Um, one of the things that we did do was we kept mics live. So you, it, it got annoying at, at times, but it was about managing people's behaviour because we wanted people to feel like they could say anything at any time. Um, there, there was a limitation with the ISL technology that we couldn't put multiple images on the screen. That was our biggest issue. So it was a technological issue rather than a, um, a, a pedagogy issue for us. But, but it, oh, sorry. sorry. It is something, Lisa, though, um, with, because what prompted this was small class sizes on campuses and we couldn't sustain economically sustain face-to-face -face lecturers so that's what the catalyst to this project was so 
in trying to draw in additional campuses, which our School of Education is wanting us to explore further, it is problematic because as soon as you bring in different campuses, different systems, it's going to require more tinkering, but it's not beyond us. <laughs> That's great. I have the same issue with uh, small numbers. And for, for instance, we've been told we need to deliver from Cairns and, um, and Townsville, as well as Bundaberg and Rocky. And so, yeah, exactly the same sort of issue with what we've had. Um, Linda, you had a question that you wanted to ask. Oh, hi. Yeah, thank you. I was interested in uh, when you're talking about professional identity and the two staff that weren't comfortable uh, versus the three that, that were, was there any relationship with um, ca with casual staff versus um, no. staff? No. no. So of the three that were really comfortable, um, one was a permanent, two were casual. Yeah. And of the two that were uncomfortable, one was casual, one was permanent. Oh, great. And so when can Gladstone jump on board this thing? <laughs> yeah. When we can get the flipping ISL to give us multiple things, well, we're in like Flynn, yeah, absolutely. That's one of the things, Linda, we actually naively went into it thinking, oh, this will be an easy thing to do systemically. Oh, my gosh, it took a two-hour conversation with timetabling for me to argue the toss about why we actually needed specific ISL spaces that we had identified as the most, as the best possible spaces to maximise this project and its success. So you have to find a great ISL space and, and a timetabling system that will allow it. But we're getting better at managing that as well. Yeah, I think this is something we need to take up with um, ITD um, because, as you've said, we're investing a lot of money in CQU Renew. We're, we're investing, talking about these huddle spaces. There is op plenty of opportunity for sort of doing this, but we need you, clearly from what you've spoken about, it needs to be done properly rather than just simply doing like Zoom links to huddle spaces. You want to, to if you really want to create that classroom dynamic, <laughs> um, you need to do a little bit more about it. Can I just ask, sorry, um, did you have to have a lecture then on the, on the campuses at the same time? So if we were to, so you only had the one, so if I was the person at Gladstone and they were Zooming to Noosa, the kids from Noosa, I just call them kids, sorry, they come in and, um, um, no lecture required there. Yeah, um, right. So what, well, what we did do, we got better at this too. In week one, we made sure that there was someone in the CAN space and someone in the Noosa space, and we all talked about uh, processes and protocols and expectations, and this is what would happen. And, and we, so as we progressed, we, we actually set it up better. But mm. after we did that first initial everyone was in the room thing, Mim, Craig, we didn't do that from there on in, did we? No, but I, I think one of the things that we did and worked well in hindsight was that in our protocols and expectations, we put a lot of accountability on those students that they had to be responsive and they had to check prior to the lecture for any materials or manipulatives that had to be gathered. So it wasn't about us being the providers of everything for them. It was about in this space, the role they had to play included this component. Mm -hmm. And it worked exceptionally well and they, they took it on board and, and really ran with it in terms that they would contact me. I don't know if you had the same thing, Nim, about whether there was materials that had to be collected, where they were, et cetera. And I think it added to the inclusivity and it, and it added to the input from the students about their belonging and their role in the room. The other thing that we did too was um, because of Craig, the nature of Craig's subject, I had to be there for exams sometimes, drop exam material off and that. And it actually became really fun to wander into each other's classes and talk to each other as, as colleagues. Mm -hmm. And it gave the students the feel that we were in touch with each other as well. So we were a team. So we were presenting as a team. Yeah. What a great initiative. Well done. Um, I think you could probably all run an in-service for all of us. <laughs> in how to, how to create a relationship in a virtual situation. I also think that, um, look, there's a lot here to think about in terms of where education is going in future and whether this is a really good, um, I think, leading by example to your students so they learn that in future they may very well be teaching remotely and, um, you know, this is an opportunity to show you how it can be done well. So great model for them. 
Fantastic, thank you so much. Um, let's move on and we'll talk to Mina, who's um, still with us and has been great because she was our first presenter. <laughs> so um, I've got uh, a couple of questions. Lisa, I think you had a question for, uh, for Mina. Just going right back to the beginning of my chat. Do you remember what it was? No, I can't find it. Oh, yes. No, actually, Mina did answer that. She asked if we could have a live demonstration of Verta. And um, uh, Mina has provided us with a link, which is lovely. Um, I wanted to ask, do we have Mina still with us? Actually, are you still here? No, okay, I'll take that offline. Uh, Sharon, so you were up next. Um, and we had a few questions for you. There was one from Richard. Are you still with us? Yes, I'm still here. Lovely. Richard, are you still there? Yes. Okay, I'll just see if I can find it. Uh, Richard has asked what the best program is for making that type of uh, PowerPoint. Sharon, could you answer that question? It was just the PowerPoint that came with um, our um, work system or actually I did that one from home a little bit as well. So just whatever office package that you have, it was just... And with um, the office, I've noticed recently they've updated their... Um, they actually give you an option too on the display of your slide. So you put the stuff in, it tells you, you could try it all these different ways, which is how I did today's presentation. So it was a bit more, but um, I actually found it, it, it was the simple parts of PowerPoint that I did to make the show. It was a white screen. It was lots of layering of um, um, the animations and so forth to make the words come. So this text box within an, a shape within the story. And so it's just layering it. And the big thing is don't make everything white until you know that it's right because tech boxes are really hard to find if they don't have an outline on a white pad. <laughs> good point. Very good point. <laughs> Linda, you had a question there too about audio. Yes. Oh, well, now that you've just said it was simply a PowerPoint, then, yeah, you can put audio. I didn't realise it was a pow just general yep. PowerPoint. I thought it must have been some sort of... Nope, just, just PowerPoint. Absolutely just PowerPoint. Um, I think... what your question about being able to talk uh, for the thing absolutely you can do that and the reason I didn't is that I was running out of time once uh, Patrick got the images to me yeah. I was simply running out of time to find appropriate voiceovers for the characters um, and that's all it was so yeah that's why I did it that way yep Susan um, thanks so on that Sharon so Patrick um, so is he a CQU employee, an illustrator? I'm just curious as to how you came by his artwork. Well, his mother was is uh, my ex-husband's sister. <laughs> <laughs> so Patrick is my nephew. So in the absence of a nephew who can create those beautiful characters, <laughs> we could just do use the same PowerPoint program and just draw in online images of people? Oh. Yeah, absolutely. So I went to Patrick and asked him to produce those for me and I asked for the three faces. So he had the happy face, the talking face and the, you know, mm, listening face is what I said to him. Give me a listening face. Um, and so all I had was those images and I was able to cut and paste as required the face into the right thing. But absolutely you can do that with um, any of the imaging packages that we're allowed to use. I'm very mindful about uh, copywriting and so forth. You could have colleagues that you've taken their photographs if they're okay with you using their image that way. You could, um, I always like to use new employees because um, they're not known to the students as a rule. So if there's a new colleague, I often use their voice or something in an activity. Um, it's, it's, it's strictly your imagination, go nuts. And when the images turned up, that's when I gave them their name and their backstory. And that's for another day, for another presentation. But all of those characters now have a life story, including the nurse, Colin. His partner is actually a senior partner at the solicitor's wow. home where Ben is. <laughs> I, I mean, I have to say, Sharon, I found it quite surprising because you did have those three images of the faces. So the faces were changing as they were answering the question or listening, um, that you 
you, you did develop this, um, you know, thing that they were a real person. You know, it wasn't just like a two-dimensional cartoon. So Susan's got another question well, there. You can tell I'm really quite interested in this, Sharon. <laughs> That's um, okay. um, also, uh, this is um, a hard question to answer. How long did it take you to put that together? Okay, I'll also be honest. Somebody asked me about the music program that I got it from. I did this a couple of years ago, so I would have to go back through my files to find that for you. Um, but I'm happy to have a look. If you want to send me an email directly, I can do that. Um, it took... Um, it, look, it probably took me about three days, but that was because it was new and if you asked if you came to me and said can you do me one of those I could probably have it done in a couple of days um, and I'm very mindful of the time that it takes yes it's one concept in an, in a whole unit but it's about it, it's about that that's the fancy concept for that module then the next one has something else and the next one's got something else and it was about that engagement yeah yeah, right. I mean, I can see that. It's sort of just one of the tools or one of the, the tools or strategies that you'd use. It's not something you'd do for every concept. Um, now, <laughs> Leanne, Leanne, you had a question? Uh, it was the same question because I was just wondering if, um, yeah, having the, the talking heads as well could appeal to to, I mean, I'm a visual person, so I'd like to read, but I did find that music a bit distracting, but maybe because it came <laughs> up. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I was concentrating that on that and finding it hard to read, and that could, uh, you know, be some students. But also, you know, some people, I can't listen to things. Um, I like to read, but some people prefer to listen, so yep. that could work as well. Um, and Leanne, some of the feedback around the music was either they loved it or they hated it. It was just distracting it was fun it was you know so it's it comes down to that personal um, option again but I'm a visual person so to sit there and just have somebody talking at me I will retain about five percent of what you said but if you show me pretty pictures and um and you know draw me a um draw me a map rather than tell me how to get somewhere I'm all over it yeah so if if there was a voiceover I would be reading with them and probably take it in both ways yep mm. Thanks. And like I said, that but was otherwise, yeah, I think it's a great idea. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, Mina, I had a question for you um, earlier. Is Verta compatible with mobile platforms as well as um, as well as like the, your desktop machine? Sorry, Mina's just um, made a comment to say that she's used um, WebGL for lip synchronisation with text. I know that um, I think Adobe Animate does this. Um, I think there's a free Adobe um, tool that you can use um, to actually, it'll sort of, you can, it can be you and so you can move your hands and you can talk and it will record you and synchronise your mouth at the same time and then you can put a character over the top of you so it's not your face. So that might be something to consider um, in future. Does anyone have any further questions that they would like to ask any of our presenters? No? All right, well, I would very much like to thank all of you today. Um, such wonderfully engaging presentations. Um, some terrific ideas. I'm, I'm really just, it's wonderful. And I love the fact that we've been given this opportunity to have a virtual conference and that we can um, see all of these things that's going on and share the new things. Lisa? Yes. Could I please just um, thank you for your um, facilitation today. Thank you. It was really well done. Oh, seriously. Uh, it was a pleasure. It was so engaging and fascinating. And it was lovely to see so many people here. It's just brilliant. So I look forward to hearing more from all of you. Um, yeah, Glossy went back to the joy of marking old-fashioned assessments, absolutely. But it has been just a wonderful um, thing to insert into uh, week 12. So thanks to Celeste and the Academic Board for uh, supporting us, yeah. And I'm looking forward to seeing as many of you as possible at upcoming uh, Scholarship of Learning and Teaching workshops because we do have a wonderful program and uh, we're getting some great feedback. So, yep, brilliant. Yes, I think, uh, Grazia, I agree with you. We should be doing these more often. So thank you all for attending 